<laughs> oh, okay, all right, all right, that's, that's pretty goddamn hilarious, but uh, no, for, for real though, what, what actually won? Really? Wow, that's, uh, that's just awful. The Academy Awards have come and gone, meaning my obligation to give a damn about them will be over for another 11 to 10 months. Lucky me. In any case, the big story of the year in my circle, since, you know, I do this for a living, was the historic achievement of Marvel's Black Panther, itself already a landmark film for genre representation and an unprecedented success for a predominantly black production, having become the first superhero movie to have been nominated for Best Picture. And while it may ultimately have not taken the prize, perhaps dependent on the unique ranked choice ballot the Academy uses for Best Picture voting, wherein being a widely liked movie that isn't most people's top pick but nobody really despises is often all ultimately preferable to being a divisive film that some voters love and put at number one, but others might be inclined to rank last. After all, while the film itself was widely praised, many older traditional Academy voters had long expressed skepticism that superhero films, or indeed any sci-fi movie, belongs in contention at all, while still others balked at rewarding the perceived monopolistic behavior of the Walt Disney Corporation. Either way, at this point, I'm less interested in talking about who would, should, will, won't, did, didn't, whatever, win, than I am about the bigger conversations surrounding the film's presence. In this case, the predictable backlash against it, i.e. whether or not this specific film deserve what will now forever be the historic distinction of being the first film in its genre to even have been nominated. Some of which can be dismissed out of hand. Sure, you are always going to have a certain level of fanboy angst over it not being a more traditionally established character or franchise like Batman or Superman, one of the major Avengers, or the notion that it should be something that elevates the genre in the vein of a Watchmen or a Dark Knight Returns type adaptation, which I'd argue this kind of does, but we'll get to that, or that this or that other big comic movie from the same year should have been considered instead of, or at least also, which, well, I mean, I definitely posit that Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which was easily the best animated movie of the year, probably the best Spider-Man movie ever, and a very likely fresh contender for the whole genre deserved to be there, definitely, but it's very difficult for animated features to get into the best picture category now that there's a separate category for them, but the rest of the year's superhero movies? Really? Because that pretty much leaves Venom, a film where I'm pretty certain at least half of the appreciation is of the ironic variety, and Aquaman, which, okay, look, folks, I liked Aquaman a whole lot, but let's be real about this, at least 60% of the whole Aquaman is actually good thing was coming from a very Andy Kaufman Elvis impersonation kind of place, but by accident, i.e. after almost a decade of every DC movie being different flavors of just god-awful, or an actual full decade if we're being brutally honest with ourselves and admitting that The Dark Knight Rises was actually kind of lousy outside of Michael Caine and Gary Oldman still being good and getting to see Scarecrow again, you know, except for the first two acts of Wonder Woman, the kind of good one that actually connected with people is the way too big, way too expensive, Flash Gordon-looking mermaid barbarian nonsense about the character popular culture has been using as a punchline for half a century, and the absurdity of that fact is kind of freaking hilarious. Up is down, cold is hot, dogs are cats, Trump is president, and the biggest DC movie is f***ing Aquaman. Who says the apocalypse doesn't have a sense of humor? I mean, if that thing is a Best Picture nominee, Alita Battle Angel might as well run for Prime Minister of Canada. So that leaves Black Panther's own direct follow-up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe timeline, Avengers Infinity War, which, okay, that's at least worth exploring a bit. If you're going to nominate one of the Marvel movies for Best Picture, why not the bigger of the two from the same year? The one that has galaxy-sized stakes, more characters, a more complicated storyline, bigger set pieces, and that crazy ending where half the universe turned into dust. Is that not the bigger, more important to the continuity, and thus better Marvel movie? Okay, yeah, I know this isn't actually a difficult question to parse, but there really are people who sincerely think like this, so look, this is what we're doing this week, okay? Anyway, to some uh, fans, the rationale is both simple to figure out and deeply unfair. It's all about posturing and political pandering. Black Panther, according to such folks, is really just another Marvel movie adhering to the established MCU formula, but it got a lot of extra media attention for having an overwhelmingly black cast, touching on themes of racism and pan-African colonialism, and thus meant something more to a certain segment of the audience, and so the Academy, like the movie press, is overrating and giving it kudos it doesn't deserve in order to score woke social justice points from, uh, well, whichever imaginary lizard people conspiracy administration people whose minds work this way believe keeps track of and hands out said points. So, okay, that's excessively stupid, but if you take it out of the answer pool, where does it leave you? After all, the two films are a little bit similar. They occupy the same genre, they're both part of the same universe, feature a bunch of the same characters, and they're both driven by a confrontation between previously established heroes and a charismatic villain who wants to do a very bad thing for sort of understandable or at least able to be empathized with reason. 
instance. So what's the difference? Well, execution for the most part, and I'm not mostly or even mainly talking about Black Panther being a better directed movie, though I think it is overall. It's better paced, more lush cinematography, better hand-to-hand -hand fight choreography, more dynamic editing and shot composition and its exterior location shooting does a generally better job of looking like we're really in a magical hidden African kingdom or Hong Kong or wherever, as opposed to, you know, interchangeable parts of rural Georgia. Though yes, Infinity War on balance has better CGI and a few more elaborate scenes like the Brawl on Titan or the Big Space Forge sequence, and it is a good movie as well. What I'm talking about is more specifically thematic execution, or phrased another way, Black Panther being the superhero movie that finally broke through with Oscar voters isn't really about whatever politics it has so much as that it has them at all. Again, consider that both films turn on the machinations of villains who believe their actions actually make them the heroes. In Infinity War, Josh Brolin's Thanos believes that resource scarcity will cause universal social collapse, and he's trying to build a doomsday weapon that will let him kill half of all life in order to make that not happen. The Avengers and Guardians, aligned to stop him, recognize that however logical this might be from Thanos' perspective, it's the logic of a lunatic space monster who needs to be stopped because evil is evil and good is good. Its secondary plot and story concerns center on magic rocks, where to get them, who's worthy of using them, extremely general questions of self-sacrifice, and not really much else. Which is fine, because the Avengers team-ups aren't so much about advancing the meta plot or developing character so much as they are about getting everyone together for a big wacky party celebrating all the plot advancement and character development that went on in the solo movies. By contrast, Black Panther's version of a similar villain-instigated narrative is that Michael B. Jordan's Eric Killmonger believes that Wakanda's policy of isolationism has made them both directly and indirectly complicit in the ongoing systemic racial oppression of black people elsewhere in the world, including in more direct terms the impoverished and fatherless childhood that helped twist him into what he is now, and he seeks to usurp the nation's throne and seize control of its high-tech weaponry in order to use it to instigate a global race war. With secondary story concerns centering on multiple other characters debating the actual nuances of these same issues within real-world historical context of colonialism, the African diaspora, and even United States imperial military policy. In effect, Black Panther, while yes, still featuring plenty of big action scenes where characters battle one another using flashy costumes and high-tech weapons, is the rare sci-fi fantasy blockbuster that engages in world-building wish fulfillment what-if scenario, in this case imagining an Afrofuturist alternate history of a black African nation that was allowed to thrive and evolve on its own without the interference of white colonialism or the slave trade, with the intent of calling wait a minute on the fantasy in question, presenting an idealized vision of Wakanda that essentially understands the appeal, and in this case at least historically sympathetic logic, of what more or less boils down to a fantasy protectionist ethnostate, but then actually explores the concept and comes away concluding that Killmonger kinda had a point, even as his methods were wrong and ultimately goal was off base. As such, the film takes the form, however optimistic it is about the eventual future, of an epic tragedy. The Black Panther himself is changed by his conflict with Killmonger to the point where his long-held beliefs about his own place in the world, the traditions of his country, and the values of his own ancestors are profoundly shaken, to the point where he ends up agreeing, at least in general, with the perspective of the supposed villain, that Wakanda had been doing it wrong all this time, that the world needs to be engaged, isolationism is bad, walls don't work when it comes to geopolitics, etc. Even as Killmonger himself, an even more tragic figure, is unable to extricate himself from the lifetime of pain and history of racial violence that corrupted his soul and hardened his heart, choosing to exit with a line that cements him as the MCU, if not the entire superhero genre to this point's most compelling antagonist ever. Just bury me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped from the ships, because they knew death was better than bondage. And that right there would be the difference between a damn good comic book movie and a damn good comic book movie that also deserves to be called one of the straight up best films of the year. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture.